the Economic Policy Institute just released a report on CEO pay versus worker pay, and the results are devastating. The report is by the left-leaning think tank, uh, the Economic Policy Institute. They looked at the trends of CEO compensation since 1978, and they found that beginning in the 1980s, CEO compensation began to rise much faster than worker pay, and during the mid-90s, began to skyrocket, hitting a massive 383 times more th than worker compensation. Now, it's a ratio of 383 times to 1. Now, through the 2000s, there were a few ups and downs before finally setting at a whopping ratio of 295 to 1 when adjusted for inflation. Now, all in all, CEO compensation at the largest corporations have actually risen by 937% since 1978. Now, the report also looked at the growth of worker compensation during the same time period and found that worker compensation grew at a paltry 10% since 1978. 10% versus 937%. That is just an astronomical difference. That is what we talk about when we talk about income inequality. Now, the EPI concluded its report by saying that since CEO compensation grew so much faster than even other highly paid workers, the market for skills was not responsible for the rapid growth of CEO compensation. That's right. So that old argument that you hear from conservatives of how they're they're better, they're they're smarter, they're they're better at their jobs, they have more skills, and that's why they get paid so much is bullshit. Now they also say that if CEOs took a little bit of a pay cut, that there would be no loss of productivity or output. So if they were to share a little bit of their gains with the workers who actually make them rich. They wouldn't lose a damn thing. So that may be a little bit off their bottom line. Now, I look at the study, and I'm pretty much blown away by the numbers. 937% since 1978. Now, the timing here isn't a coincidence. Now, remember in 1976, we had Buckley Vallejo, right? The case that pretty much decided that money was political speech. But shortly after that decision, would you look at that? It jumped 29 to 1 for the ratio. Now, that's actually not a bad ratio at all, I think. I think even 50 to 1 is pretty reasonable. You're the CEO. You do deserve a good chunk of the payoff. You took the risk. You built a business, and there should be that incentive there. A little bit of inequality is okay. But when it gets to massive levels of inequality, that's when you run into problems. Anyway, after the... After the 80s and Reagan's morning in America, this number went fucking crazy and actually got really bad until Clinton. Actually, after Clinton, it got even worse after Clinton and during Clinton. Now, we had a good economy under Clinton, but at the end of his term in 2000, that's when it really hit the peak. Now, with all of that said, I want to go to my panel and ask, what do you guys think about these numbers? Do CEOs deserve such high pay? And uh, who should decide what's fair when it comes to CEO compensation? And finally, what effect does this inequality have on your estimation on the overall economy? And uh, we'll start with we'll start with uh, you, Stephen. Okay. Um, well, I mean, for me, I mean, it's absolutely outrageous and egregious that the CEOs are getting paid that much, but. It's important to point out that this, this is certainly isn't all CEOs. I mean, Jenk, he's CEO of the Young Turks. He's certainly not got, getting getting paid 300 times more than the average worker at the Young Turks because they're not getting paid much to begin with, as most of them, and tell us. But the, the, <laughs> that's what they always complain about. But um, the for me, it's almost like one of the arguments is saying, oh, the CEOs, they've got to get their pay. When we had, well... It was across the world when we had the huge banking collapse and say, 
um, bankers' bonuses. Well, they've got to get these bonuses because if they don't get good pay, and similarly the CEOs, if they don't get, have a good wage and good salary, then they're going to leave. They're going to go to other companies. And we want to have the, the brightest and the best. But as you said, paying more money to these people doesn't mean that you're getting the brightest and the best. And for me, as to who should be responsible in regulating this pay, it's I really don't think the government should have any real say in how a, a private firm re regulates kind of who gets paid what within it, you know, apart from minimum wage and such. You can fix it fix it by kind of tax rates and stuff for the rich. So uh, so, so you you'd be against a maximum wage. Um yeah, I think I would be against a maximum wage, but I think the people who should be in charge. I mean, I I mean, honestly, I'd have to look into more detail in terms of maximum wage that I, I maybe agree with some astronomically high rate that's almost where it is now and just say no further. But I think it should be the shareholders of companies that, that dictate the wage. Now, I know there's a large problem that, you know, I'm sure there's hundreds of kind of individual instances where you say, well, the shareholders are the CEOs of the companies, already the people who are getting paid by the companies, so they'll set their own wage and, and that could be a problem with these ever-increasing CEO pays. But I, th I think the shareholders should play a larger part, certainly in these big companies where this large disparaging gap has happened. Right. I, you know, I, I'd have to say that um, I think I think the, the problem with uh, giving the, the shareholders, and I'm not saying I'm advocating for uh, the government to step in. I'm just saying that there's that issue with, you know, as long as the company is doing well, the shareholders will pretty much allow a CEO free reign to do what he wants. And that, that even includes like, hey, you know, we did really good this this uh, fiscal, you know, this quarter. I want to raise. And they'll be like, yeah, sure, we're doing great. Why not? Here you go. And that's that's what I see happening a lot. And, you know, there there is that where CEOs are able to give themselves raises. And that's that uh, can create some problems. But let's go to you, Dan. Uh, what do you guys, what do you think? You know, we talk about this a lot on this show, which is the press and the media. And, I mean, this is where I think the huge failure from mainstream press and especially financial press where you, like a lot of the times, you know, it's like when you watch sports, you have a former catcher and pitcher telling you about sports. Great. The problem with that in the economic field is, is that there's a lot of vested interest happening in financial reporting. So it took legitimately in the States and in Canada and a lot of places in the world the Occupy movement to actually get the phrase income inequality into the newspapers at a rate that where it should be. The other interesting thing about this that I thought um, the study was that if you look at industries like fast food, which we've seen a lot of action recently in terms of raising their minimum wage, well this study shows it's about a thousand times the pay in that specific um, industry versus CEO to worker. So I mean these are the kinds of things that are getting out of control. In Canada the same thing. It's about January 3rd. Um, the, the average top executive in Canada is making what a person, the average Canadian makes in a year. Um, so yeah, like I, I, I know what people are talking about with you know the immediate shrills of communism if we start talking about maximum wages. But the problem is, is these people are taking down the economy by being reckless with how they they actually um, operate their businesses and the problem is is they don't believe in government until their businesses get into severe trouble and then expect bailouts and that system needs to change so I would suggest um, income tax corporate income tax rates rising which I know sends people screaming but more importantly it would be really great if, if the media at some point started to st talk about these things insane uh, sentence structures. Like the idea that we get away with these people, the idea if you don't make a thousand times what your worker makes, it's communism, <laughs> you know, which is legitimately what you hear. Or the idea that if you raise the corporate income tax, the businesses will just run screaming from the country. You know, at some point, it would be nice if people called them on their bluff. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, let's go to you, Jordan. What do you think about all this? Um, now, my big issue with this is not so much that the CEO pay is so high as it is that the average worker pay is so much lower. Uh, quite frankly, as, as long as if you're paying your people enough you know, to where they can uh, maybe not even necessarily live nice plush lives, because I don't know that a company owes you that, um, but at least you, know, you pay enough to make ends meet to where they're not having to live off government programs while working 40 hours a week. 
uh, you know, I think you can you can pay your CEO whatever you want, and this this is can be a successful business model. Uh, companies have shown this, um, and not just like in in niche markets either. You've got Costco that competes in the retail industry against companies like Walmart that does this and does just fine. You've got In and Out Burger and fast food that competes against McDonald's and Burger Kings and the companies and that pays their employees very well and it does just fine. Um, so that's hey, you know, if you want to pay your your CEO and whatever they want to make, as long as the people in the bottom, you know, can go to work and then come home and, and not go without, pay your, your CEO whatever you want to pay. Um, but yes, I, I know that's, I mean, that's, I'm not trying to like just, you know, turn something for the sake of a phrase, but to me, high CEO pay is not the problem. It's low average worker pay that's the problem. Yeah, I think you bring up, you bring up a really, really good point about that. Because that also, you know, fits into into the discussion about income inequality, you know, and it's not it, it's not I say it's, it's both problems. I think right now you have CEO pay too high, and that's making it so that the worker pay is so low, right? Because once again, you get into the in, into the thing where these CEOs have so much extra money that they're never going to be able to spend. Well, what do they do? They either hoard it, right, which takes it out of the economy. You know, they might reinvest it in their business. That's good. We want them to do that. But most likely, they'll often do stock, stock buybacks to inflate their prices, to inflate their company's worth, and then use that money to pay themselves higher bonuses. It's just – it makes absolutely no sense. And so I think that fits into the economic uh, inequality argument. Dan? Yeah, I was just going to say I agree with both of you, and I'd also just add that, like, the problem here, of course, is is that when you have the guy at the bottom ask, you know, Oliver Twist style, could I have some more? Sorry, we can't afford it. And that's the real issues that we're having right now in in a lot of these uh, places where income inequality is an issue in all of these countries is that, much like in Canada and the States, that's the issue is that, yeah, okay, great, I'd, I'd agree with you that whatever, we don't have to have a ceiling on, on CEO wages or compensation, but the problem is, is that they use this, they turn around and use it when the guy wants to make, who's making eight bucks, wants to make ten. And of course they use things like, well then, Big Macs are going to cost twenty dollars magically. Of course, you know, when you come to Canada or Ontario, our minimum wage is around eleven bucks now. Or, I assure you, we're not spending twenty dollars on Big Macs, so it, magically it's okay. And you've seen that, um, those memes go around social media mm -hmm. from different places in the world where, where these these you know restaurants in different countries have given their workers wage. So this goes back to why don't we ever see you know more of this in the in the mainstream media? Um, why don't you see these kinds of things being talked about? This is an out and out lie, and I really would love to see it get called out more. You can't afford it. You're choosing not to, and we know where the money's going. It's going back to the top. So. If those two things weren't connected, I'd be a little bit more lenient to say, like, whatever, that you can, your CEO can make whatever you want. And, and, you know, the money doesn't always just go back to the top. It also goes into, ironically, stopping minimum wage laws. Right. And you see a lot of lobbying dollars being pushed towards candidates that will oppose any sort of, you know, attempt to not end inequality, because you can't, Right but reduce the levels of inequality to a level that won't destroy the economy. And it's sad because we keep, as a progressive um, you know, movement or whatever, we keep letting them kick the goalposts to the right. Like, I you know, we even started off as conceding that we'd be okay with, like, 100 to 1 or, we you know, like, 200 to 1, but when it gets to, like, where's the bar? Um, and that's the other issue that I have is, is that, we really do have to start getting um, a lot tougher with this, especially, and we'll talk about this a bit later in the show, but, you know, we're, we're a debt society right now, North America especially. Um, we are dependent on credit cards and loans and, you know, our houses are mortgaged out and it's, you know, everything's kind of teetering and it's, it's the selfishness of that industry, of these industries and these CEOs that don't see the crash coming. Like, people are not well off. So this is another issue. Like, you're not just gambling with, with your own company. You're gambling with the entire economy. We do all want everyone's wages to keep on increasing. It's just a matter that if the CEO pay is going to kind of increase his own salary by 20%, then 
everyone else in the company gets a 20%. And if you keep the percentage increases the same, then I'd kind of be happy with that. And that's to Dan's point with the media. I think one of the points, and this certainly isn't the only reason why the media isn't covering it that much, is simply because, it, same with climate change, it's just not that particularly a sexy or interesting topic that people can get excited about. They should get excited about it. And there's lots of interesting things like talking about these sort of charts and stuff and these studies. They're interesting, they're intriguing. But for the mainstream media, to them, it's not, you know, we're talking about numbers and uh, we don't want to, that's a bit confusing for our audience. And they just think it's too complex for the audience. They're wrong in that, but that's one of the reasons, I think, why the media doesn't cover it. Well, I don't know how you guys have uh, in, in, over in the UK or even in the States, but like, what I think is always funny is how they cover financial news, right? So they'll bring in an economist from said bank, but then they'll bring in like a left-wing economist, and he's always highlighted as like a union economist or a like a, a socialist economist to give you what is really like the sane news, which is you know perhaps this is a little out of control, um, and and that's really where it fails. Like that's where you had guys like Matt Taibbi and Rolling Stone become kind of rock stars in these in these fields because there are, there we lack a, a coherent and and um, I, I would say, like, a really good voice in the press that tells you about the financial markets. Like, let's be really blunt and honest. Most people can't read a stock ticker. They, you know, most people are not engaged in the, uh, you know, the what the minutiae of the the Wall Street Journal. And when you hear like, well, this is just common knowledge from the news, you think, well, yeah, we we can't raise the corporate tax rate because people, businesses might run screaming, and the guy said it on television, and then the guy said it in the Wall Street Journal, and those are the financial guys, so, and of course, they've got vested interests, like we saw with Jim Cramer, and, you know, that would be the far extreme of it, um, going back to, to the last crisis, or the, I shouldn't say the last crisis, but the last giant crisis, but that's where these things need to start going, in my opinion, is you need to start having these conversations um, and start changing the narrative. And Occupy was a good start for that, but I'd like to see it continued. And as we always say, it's sort of a pipe dream because we don't have a lot of faith in the mainstream media. But at least there's places like this now to start shaping those conversations on social media. The bottom line is is that like this is the economy, folks. Like if you're if 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 Jim in Oklahoma cannot pay his visa bill ever again, and you know, and and he can't buy a car and buy a house. We're some serious problems, and you know I brought this up I think on this show before, but you know you go through um, the hilarious stories from the millennial generation marketing campaigns from the big companies, GM. You know what if we make different color cars? That's not the problem. <laughs> like people are in serious debt, and I think that's what's really interesting. And you know you saw here in Canada, you know to answer my own question about the media, the problem of course as we always know is vested interests all around. So here in Canada we got into a real uh, a few months of starting to look at unpaid internships and how they're really bad. And then what happened? Well, we found out that two of our big communication companies, like, of our big three, like we call them, uh, Bell and Rogers, were running a lot of <laughs> these internship scandals themselves. And a lot of the press was, too, in the, in the press room. So all of a sudden, you know, that coverage seemed to fall off the radar a little bit. So, you know... That's the unfortunate thing about it is, is, is you need these places like the Young Turks Network um, and you're starting to see more and more of them. Here in Canada, there's a bunch of young people that are starting a new company called Ricochet to, to address just that. Like, and, and that it really does start from a public awareness, I think, though. It starts from your media because people need to read it. People don't know. Like We could you know, be snobby about it and be like, we know, but the average person, all they get is a, is a, is a complete um, diet of you know, lower taxes, lower corporate tax rates, everything will be fine, unions are bad, and it needs to be turned around. Right, and just to make one more point about the media before we move on, I think another problem with how we cover this discussion on the media is that we have, you know, we, we basically have our major media organization, whenever someone brings up the question of income inequality or the problem of income inequality or, or the question of what we can do about it and, you know, raising the minimum wage, there, this, this major news channel, which is the most trusted in America, we, just, we did a story on this yesterday about that, they are always on one side, always against it. 
And so when you have a, a major a media empire essentially that is so large and so all encompassing, and when you have so many people listening to it, you're right. They are going to get that that steady diet of uh, uh, can't raise the minimum wage, it'll kill jobs. You can't raise taxes, it'll kill jobs. If you raise corporate taxes, the corporations, like you said, Dan, they'll run screaming for the hills, and the entire economy will implode. Well, if you continue to have inequality at such a high level, the economy is going to implode anyway. It already did in 2008, and it did in 1929, and we're probably heading for another one. Just to, to finish that point, what you're talking about with, with Fox or you know whoever, this is forgetting just those extreme wings. This is just that the left has just done whatever you want to call it, progressive politics, the left, quote unquote. They've done a terrible job of marketing those ideas to the average guy. Like they've lost a huge communications battle over the, over our lifetimes. And so now our generation is kind of left holding the bag, trying to go, okay, wait, you know, I'm in student debt, I'm working at McDonald's, I can't get paid, um, you know, where's my union at my workplace? Oh, the union actually, the older folks at my union sold out my union three years ago, and so now there's like a two-tiered aspect into my union. So all of these, you know, these these things are coming to play. And like, but I'll give you an example here: CBC, our main business show, the one that they promote, has a guy named Kevin O'Leary. Americans will know him from a, a show called Shark Tank. Um, he's a crazy billionaire. Like, he's really not, but that's the role he plays on television. And that's the public broadcaster that has these jokers on there. People that say things like, you know, like income inequality is fantastic, and that you know the people that are starving in Africa, it just gives them incentive to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. With you know, we talked about this before in the show with Glenn Beck that there's all these kind of like um, clown rodeo clowns that that have the the pulpit, but that's on the the the, the CBC here, which is the left wing media, right? And so that, that's what I'm trying to say. It's not just the Fox News. It's gotten much deeper into just the collective wisdom is. And you'll also see, like you said tonight when you read the study, it's a left-wing think tank. Very rarely will you hear the news media say a right-wing think tank. And, and that's really interesting, too. Think tanks from the 70s throughout now have had a large history of being right wing and over 30 years we kind of have forgotten that and it's just like oh it's just a general consensus from so and so think tank um, but the, there's very few of the socialist ones or whatever you want to call them right um, okay Jordan you get the uh, final word uh, take us out and uh, we'll head out to the next segment man uh, yeah Dan uh, again uh, Brings it with the excellent points, and so I guess uh, after uh, Dan's launched a real, uh, a real nice, nuanced uh, uh, conversation there, I guess I'll close us with a talking point, and just point out that um, you know the golden age of America, and, and let's let's again let's be real. When we say the golden age of America, we mean you know the golden age for white middle class males. Um, in the, the 50s and 60s, but it worked for that segment of the economy because laws were designed to make it work for that segment of the population. If you, with those laws gone away, the same economic policies would bring about the same results, just more broadly. Um, but yeah, so uh, under Eisenhower's administration, you know, a Republican president, uh, we had a corporate tax rate of 900, and CEO pay compared to average employee pay was nowhere near where it is now. And not only did companies do just fine, they built America into the superpower to end all superpowers. Um, and you know now we're becoming less and less relevant in the world. Uh, we've got more income inequality in America now than ancient Rome had when it collapsed. Um, that's you know that's that's a devastating statistic. And I get. That whenever we say there was a 90% income uh, or 90% corporate tax rate, there were loopholes. The, the effective tax rate was not 90%. Y you can avoid actually, all that in the comments. We're not idiots. But the effective tax rate right. was still much higher than it is now. Absolutely, that's that's an important point to 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 throw in there. It was, it was somewhere around 50% what they paid. But uh, mm -hmm. you go ahead and finish your point. Sorry. But yeah, so I mean, so that the this this again, not only like it, what Dan says, not only is it right, you know, it's not just the right thing to do and to point out, but historically, it the, it, it it bears out that it, it's it's true, and and that's the accepted fact. 
it's a, the accepted fact in America is that the 50s and 60s were this wonderful time that made us a prosperous nation and a, a powerhouse to be reckoned with on the world stage. And everything we've done since the 80s is to flee the policies of the 50s and 60s, at least the economic policies, that made us you know, who we are. Uh, there are certain parts of the 50s and 60s that needed to be left behind, and we've already mentioned those. But the, the economic policies had a lot going for them, and all we've done since then is try to throw out as many of them as we could. Isn't it an odd? Sorry. I was gonna say, isn't it odd that the family values voters never worry about that? <laughs> like you know, the things that keep families together, like jobs, houses, shelter. <laughs> like that's somehow off the radar. The 1950s and 60s are amazing, except for the part where we did all the things that gave us all these great things, like houses, cars, shelter. Anyways. Yeah, well, Dan, that, that, that's because it's morning in America. <laughs> right. And how else? How else can you enjoy the morning than being outside without a home? Right. Yeah, I think you're outside to enjoy the morning. I always thought it was a different spelling of morning when Reagan said oh. that. But it's, 